Hey, hey, everybody. Happy Monday. You guys hear me okay? Awesome. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining this session today. My name is Dr. Kendall Latham. I'm a K-12 education strategist at Dell, and I'll be moderating our amazing roundtable discussion today with my colleague, Kerry Warnock. Um, a little bit about the session um, today, we're going to do some quick intros. We will talk a little bit about the why behind Girls Who Game, and then we'll dive into really just the discussion. And so throughout this entire time, please add your questions to the chat or to the Q&A because we will all be moderating the chat and providing um, responses and maybe resources. So feel free to go ahead and answer your question and then we will hold about five to ten minutes at the end for um, questions and you can come on camera and ask those questions as well so let's dive in and let's do some introductions so matt if you don't mind you're on mute Okay, so Matt, I'm going to hand it over to Debbie and you do your intro. Hi, I am Debbie Unger. I'm a middle school librarian at Lassiter Middle School. And I was lucky enough to kind of fall into coaching our Girls Who Game team. And now it is one of the things that I think I'm most proud of out of my entire teaching career. So I got very lucky and I have an amazing guest with us today. Her name is Karis Arnold. She was a sixth grader. She's a legacy in our tech squad. Her older brother's been with me for three years. And so Karis came into Girls Who Game and has just stood out as a total rock star. And she is my leader for next year. So she's like the head of Girls Who Game. Hi. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> all right, Matt, are you good now, sir? Can, can can you all hear me? I'm so sorry. Okay, it changed my microphone for some reason. I don't know why. Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, I, I currently work uh, as a regional consultant for High School Esports League uh, for the Southeast, and I'm, I'm also taking it on the Northeast. But uh, before, when I was working with Girls Who Game, I was working for Jefferson County Public Schools in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, as a digital innovation leader slash learning coach um, in Esports League. So um, I, I was lucky enough to meet uh, Dr. Latham one day and talk to her about Girls Who Game. And we said, oh, my gosh, we had to have this. And Debbie Unger is the per perfect person for it. So and that started our year long journey of the wonderfulness that is Girls Who Game. So. Thank you so much, Matt. I appreciate it. And also they were willing to take a leap of faith during a pandemic to try this brand new program that they said, yes, we're all in and we want to scale this. So, again, kudos to them. And I think, Matt, it was a great segue that you started to talk about kind of the journey behind Girls Who Game inside of JCPS. And so can you and Debbie kind of explain to us why you thought, um, you know, bringing in Girls Who Game was a really important thing for your mission or furthermore, why innovation is important to students and teachers? Yeah, um, so we were really lucky in that we had a lot of people at the district level um, in Jefferson County who were very invested in trying to reach kids in another way. Like it's something like 99.8% of kids play video games or something like that. It's just an insane number. Um, and so you, you have to meet these kids where they are um, to really do that. So it kind of was a lot of things coming together. We had our high school people um, at the CTE level who were interested in funding um, some esports initiatives. And then um, at our level, um, we are the innovation branch of IT for our school district. And we really saw Minecraft as an opportunity, um, especially since EDU, uh, the EDU edition was coming to Chromebooks. Like this is our shot to really reach almost all of the 100,000 kids in our district with something that we knew they would be interested in and we knew that they had experience with. Um, so when we, we met with Dell, we met with uh, Dr. Latham and Nathaniel Blair. He's one of the salespeople for Dell, who I love. Um, and uh, they really started talking to uh, my boss, Heather, and I about, um, you know, what that looked like and what it could be. And, you know, there's there's so many great schools and so many great coaches that we knew would be all over that. Um, uh, Debbie is a, is a superstar. Um, and it kind of coincided with when we were, I, I can actually see Steven Isaacs uh, in the chat, who is a, a Minecraft all-star. Um, and I, so we, we started doing Minecraft training for our teachers and it all just kind of like layered together to make, make sense. Um, so yeah, I hope that Debbie, answered the question. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I mean, 
I think it's important for people to hear kind of how it got started. One of the things you said about you had a lot of district people, district staff who were interested, that kind of pinged my ear a little bit because I could hear someone buzzing saying to me, but Carrie, my district staff won't be supportive. How do I do this anyways? So uh, I'm also curious to hear kind of, you know, what if they hadn't been so supportive? What if you and your boss hadn't, you know, really been able to listen to Dr. Latham and, and see this as a, as a change agency um, piece that you could add to a school? But knowing that Debbie was so excited about this process or could be excited or could be the right person, um, Debbie, tell us from your perspective, why it was so important for Lassiter? Like, why was innovation important? Why Girls Who Game? Okay, I think any time that you can get kids and make the learning fun is an opportunity. And so when Matt reached out, I was like, yeah, that's awesome. Also, gamification, it doesn't matter what I do. If I gamify it with my students, they're going to be more engaged. They're more likely to want to participate. And it just kind of builds a better momentum. Also, from the librarian standpoint, I got to work with kids in a different way. And I knew a club like this would help me do that. All of this happened during COVID. So I'm looking at students through a screen. And as a librarian, I don't have my books behind me anymore. So this took over what I would normally do in the classroom with kids. And it became such a downward spiral and such an amazing opportunity to communicate, innovate, get creative with kids in a different way outside of just literature. But we also read a lot because you do a lot of research in this. So it tied that in. It's a really cool way when you connect the dots with Girls Who Game and it just becomes a massive opportunity for your students. And I want to comment on if you don't have support at a district. I'm, I had supported district, so I was lucky. Now, on a building level, my principal probably still doesn't know what I have done with these students and what these kids are capable of doing but I advocated for the kids. He knows we want stuff, so he loves it, okay? So as an individual, if you're interested in this, don't say, well, I don't have a real supportive administration. And I will say he buys me whatever books I want, but this Minecraft stuff is crazy to him. So he doesn't, he doesn't really wanna get involved. I did it on my own with the support of my district and we did fantastic. You have to take the initiative. You have to put the time in and front load it and you will learn so much from your kids. It's an incredible opportunity and anyone, anyone can do this. If I can do this, coding, Minecraft, the kids have taught me everything I know about it. Anyone can do it. That's great, Debbie. And I think we always say too, like, for a teacher to take this on is you don't have to be an expert in Minecraft, right? Like you just have to be willing to say, hey, I'm going to bring some girls together and we're going to have fun. And then we're going to provide support and professional learning um, to support you guys. So, um, all right, Karis, we want to hear from you. OK, so tell us a little bit about what you're most proud of being part of Girls Who Game. Um, I'm really proud of how we did and how we learned together as a team, um, because that brought us closer and I just, I wasn't the only one that had ideas. Um, my teammates, the girls, they had amazing ideas that I would have not thought of. And that's what brung us close as a team. And um, I'm proud that we got so close because it like taught me lots of things um, about technology because this was my first year of middle school and I was never in anything with technology before in elementary school. And I think that really taught me things about technology and how it works and how it's just great to be in the female technology um, because it will help for my future. So, That's you great. know, she brought up a really interesting point, Dr. Latham. She said she wasn't involved in elementary school. So I thought I would point out because we didn't say this at the beginning, girls who gain really first, we first targeted fourth through eighth graders. That was kind of the first target group, um, but we've expanded a bit. And so we have students younger, we have students older, and now we have even a, even a college group. So, you know, I wish we could get our elementary schools connected to our middle schools, right? So that Karis and other girls don't have to say, well, I didn't really do anything with technology in elementary. So. Thank you, Karis, for that push, because we need to do that. We need to connect our elementaries and our middles and our high schools, and we need to give new girls more opportunities, right? Yeah, definitely. 
um, because I did have STLP, but that was only available for the fifth graders um, in my elementary school. So it's kind of like not really fun for all the other kids. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that we need to get like other girls involved from elementary. Well, and that's a great piece of learning for us, for sure, Karis. Yeah. Um, appreciate that. So another question for you, if you don't mind. Um, so we talk all the time around Girls Who Game, and it's really focused on global competencies, right? Like really focused on collaboration, critical thinking, communication, problem solving, um, how you guys are working as a team. So when we think about those global competencies. How do you think Girls Who Game is preparing you for those for your future? Um, I think it's preparing me for my future because um, it's part of I, if I want to be in the female leader in technology, I want to be a female leader in technology in the future. So it helps a lot with that. Um, and like in the future, it'll get me ready for college in high school because we're probably going to be using a lot of technology. And it got me ready um, a lot because I'm going to be using iPads for middle school. So it really helped me with that. And overall, I just think it will help me um, with the female leader in technology for high school and like jobs in the future, because that's most important in life. <laughs> so I think it helped me a lot with all that stuff. I want to throw in the other thing for Karis that I got to see, and this is this is just a, a teacher thing that other teachers will be excited about. I got to watch Karis come in and not know any of these other girls, <laughs> and now she's the leader of the group. She grew so much this year from the first time I met her on a Zoom call till now where she's talking to all of these adults. So, I mean, it was such a good opportunity for these girls to feel that little, you know, that little push of leadership. Hey, yeah. you can do this. I know you can do it. I got to see my girls do so many different things this year. That was amazing. And also they taught me a lot, but we'll talk about that later. But for the girls, I got to see her grow as a leader. Yeah. And by the time she is, I don't know, out of high school, she's going to be running a corporation. That's awesome. I can't wait to see that. Maybe she'll be my boss someday. I hope they're all going to be my bosses and that would be a really good bonus for starting them out in middle school. <laughs> Absolutely. I can't wait. Well, Matt, tell us about um, any ideas and ways that Jefferson County Public Schools decided to scale Girls Who Game beyond, you know, maybe one school or a couple of schools. What happened? Um, yeah, so uh, one of the nice things about our team in Jefferson County was we're, we're a very loud bunch um, in person and on social media. So, uh, you know, Debbie started doing this in the spring of 2020, right? That's when it was. Um, yes. And so, you know, we have 30 something middle schools. We have 96 high schools there or 96 elementary schools. I'm sorry. So uh, people saw the awesome work she was doing and they were like, we, we want to get on that too. Like we, we love how invested she is, how invested her school is, how invested her girls are. So um, we, we really came up with a plan um, with uh, Kendall and with um, uh, Julie, uh, a couple other people um, that, that we worked with pretty closely uh, to really create a PLC model for our teachers. So um, we started out with like a big kickoff. I think we had, uh, what was it, Dr. Latham, like 20 something teachers in attendance um, where we went through different sessions that were being led by, um, you know, uh, different women in tech about different things like um, here's the global competencies and here's um, here's how you structure your club. And, you know, here's some ideas. Debbie led a couple sessions, I believe, and she was there to support the whole time. Um, and so then we kind of we matched up our, our coaches and our schools with, you know, what kind of made sense, who had a similar idea and feel for what they wanted to do, um, who had similar groups of students and stuff like that. Um, and that's that's really how we structured it going forward. You know, um, I, I was kind of like the point of contact as the, the district person um, with everyone uh, with Girls Who Game. Uh, but then, you know, we had PLC leaders who were experienced Girls Who Game coaches um, who really helped lead the way as well. So. Um, I think it, it really, you know, it looks different depending on how big your district is. Obviously we were gigantic. So a PLC model made sense for us, uh, to kind of, you know, divvy it up a little bit more. If you've only got like, you know, three to six schools it you know, it'll look a little different for you as well. So. 
Matt, that's great. I mean, I think really that PLC model when you're larger districts, that is the, the best way to approach and really building that community as well, too, because sometimes teachers feel very alone in the journey. And through that PLC model, you really are developing community and can learn from and with each other. And also Girls Who Game as a whole across North America, we build that community as well. So using Microsoft Teams, um, we're having the different teacher champions communicate, collaborate, ask questions, um, and also have that opportunity to just, again, learn from and with each other. So thank you, Matt. Debbie, anything you want to add about that as far as kind of at your school, like how you were able to su successfully implement the program? I think that COVID actually really helped because like I said, I, I wasn't in a room full of 8,000 books. So my focus became what we were going to do with Girls Who Game. One of the things I love the most about um, my mentor, Julie Foss, is amazing she's one of the most amazing people i ever met i never felt alone when i was doing this also even though my principal had no idea what i was doing i was never alone girls who game supported me the entire time matt at the district level supported me kendall you supported me so much i would reach out to you guys so there's so many different resources and it, it was just an amazing experience at first i had no idea what i'm doing i may not know what i'm doing today but I never hesitated to reach out and say, hey, I'm not sure about this. Can you help me? And it was no problem whatsoever. The other thing is we were able to reach out within the community. And I learned a lot from community partnerships and talking to different people in the community that we were able to tie in to the sustainable restaurant and then to the sustainable community that they built for their level two. And that was also amazing, especially during COVID. We had so many community people. Once I started reaching out, they would talk to other people that wanted to talk to the girls and work with the girls. And next year, that's going to look so different when we're actually physically in the building. I think it's just going to blow up and be amazing for the girls um, because it was at a small scale on Zoom calls. But, you know, it, it changes once that we get back into the school. So I never felt alone. There are so many lessons and resources and the lessons I have to tell you, teacher standpoint, you could use those in a regular classroom any day. They're fantastic. Thanks, Debbie. And you bring up two really big ideas. You mentioned Julie Foss. OK, so Julie Foss is our uh, professional learning consultant. So as part of our Girls Who Game program that we really believe in building educator, educator capacity. And so we provide professional learning to support you and the clubs. Right. We also provide a curricular resource guide that you can use if you want. You don't have to, but it's really outlined over the course of 12 weeks and it's focused on a culminating challenge. And so Debbie mentioned the uh, sustainable community. That was a, the most recent um, culminating challenge that the teams worked through through during the spring. And so it was all based off the UN Sustainable Goals. So when we talk, talk about authentic application, that is what we're referring to. So it's that culminating challenge that all the clubs are working towards. So uh, thinking about the three core reasons that Games for Change outlines why gaming is so important or why systems thinking or design thinking is important. Um, you know, tell us why this might be worth integrating into a curriculum or why, from a kid's perspective, we should really think about, you know, adding girls who game or really using the UN SDGs as well in this problem solving mode using Minecraft. Like, why should we do those things? And why is that important um, for their design thinking and for their ability to really think through systems? Why? Why do we think that's important? From a kid's perspective, I think. I think it's important because um, you get to build so many things. And um, like our team, we built an eco-friendly um, for bees and and we added it to our map. And that just like, it brought so much life to. <laughs> the bees life. were my favorite yeah. too. You guys taught me how to make the bees. The bees, listen, I was so excited with the bees, Karis. And they will tell you, I was in our text chat, yeah. texting them, look, I'm holding a bee. Cause if you hold a flower, the bee will come to you. And that was something I had never known. But talking about like the, the beehive that they added in the ecosystem, we learned about honey and the beehive and those things yeah. to put it in there. So every piece that the kids put in, um, the girls put in, 
they learned about why that created a sustainable community. And then we looked at our community in Louisville. So it was global and it was local. And I'm telling you, there is no other curriculum that does this in a cool way that kids will enjoy. If I said, Karis, we're going to learn about global and local economies. Is that exciting to you? No. If I'm like, we're going to do it in Minecraft. Is that exciting? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right, having awesome. trouble with my, uh, my my microphone button there. Was that, is there anything else I should say? <laughs> no, I was having trouble with my button there. Sorry about that. I love your example of the local and the global and connecting those together because I think sometimes as educators and, and as global thinkers, right, we hear a lot about the the let's build global citizenship. But sometimes we have to look right next door and say, what is in my local community as well? And let's start there and let's connect that to a bigger idea. So I'm so glad you shared that example with us. Thanks guys. So, and this question can be for anybody, right? So if we've got um, the fall coming up, so we've got a new cohort, we've got districts that are interested in girls who gain, um, what do you wish teacher champions knew, right? So like, what are some pieces of advice or some nuggets that could help these new clubs be successful? Um, what I wish teachers knew were that technology issues, there's a lot of technology issues. Um, so we, as our team, we had to teach Miss Unger a lot. <laughs> um, and especially um, over COVID, we had to do online. So she, we had to teach like the mic and all that, how to work all that. And we had um, troubles sometimes with that stuff and also Minecraft we had to teach her like about the bees a lot of that stuff so I wish teachers knew a little bit more about that stuff and so we had to teach Miss Unger a lot about that stuff and how to build and stuff like that um but yes yeah, like some teachers we need like technology issues there's going to be a lot of that um, cause technology ain't going to work a hundred percent of the time, but, um, and with Minecraft, there is a lot of obstacles and things. <laughs> so maybe for me not to get as stressed out when the technology yeah. doesn't work. I think <laughs> adults get more stressed out about that than you guys do. <laughs> um, I think that the most important thing for people to know is you don't have to know everything going in and what she yeah. was talking about teaching me. I learned so much from my girls. I have grown so much as a teacher um, and a librarian and looking forward to what I'm doing in school overall next year is so different. And I have a totally different way of thinking now than I ever would have before. I think about it always from the kid's perspective. And as a young teacher, I thought that I got kind of old though over the year. I don't know how that happened. And so, you know, that kind of shifts because you're worried about the standards and this and that. But it is so natural and it is such a growing experience for everyone involved. So don't ever think that you have to know everything going into it. I think that's the biggest thing. Don't think you like if you hear Girls Who Game in Minecraft and you don't know anything about it, it would be like, no, I'm not going to do that. And maybe if somebody else besides Matt would have asked me, I might not have said yes. Matt has a contagious energy. And I was like, absolutely. So, I mean, just don't ever be scared because the kids are going to teach you what you don't know. And that's okay. And that's the beauty of it. That's what is powerful about the whole thing. It's learning for everyone. Yeah, and I, I think from the district perspective, like you have to really take everything, but the actual like thing off the plate for the teacher. Like the, I shouldn't have gone in making, making Debbie accountable for devices and contracts and things like that. Like that's as a district person, that's on me. And she's there to, to make the magic with her with her girls. Like that's the only the only job that Debbie has is to make that experience awesome for all of them. Matt, I love that. Make make the magic for the girls, right? And I think one of the things that we've seen from districts being very successful is that partnership, right? That we've got technology department working hand in hand with curriculum instruction, working with the teachers at the school at school level. So it really has to be a collaboration and not an isolation, um, especially when you're thinking about scaling. 
And I love the fact that Debbie is willing to say, hey, I don't know how to use the technology, but I know my girls do. And can you guys teach me? So it's not just a one way, right? It truly is. We're all going to learn from and with each other, which is pretty amazing. The other thing that was really, really powerful, especially at the beginning, and this is like when I started in the spring. So Karis, I didn't even have you yet. You were still in elementary school. Watching my girls come together. The girls that I had, I have to say, like it was COVID. So I was like, okay, whoever's on Instagram that wants to join us type deal. Okay. I had a lot of kids that were already in tech squad, like your older brother cares. Um, and those kids helped me pull other kids, but my girls probably now they would, but a year ago would have never sat together in the cafeteria. These are not kids that normally girls you would normally see. There's so much that goes on in middle school and high school, so much drama. These girls, we didn't have that drama. There was none of that, but in a different setting, these girls would not have come together the way they did. And that is another thing that was so beautiful for me in Girls Who Game was watching these girls come together. All of that other stuff didn't matter. It was the build. It was learning how to do it. It was working together. It was sharing ideas like Karis talked about earlier everyone nobody discounted anyone no one was like annoyed with people that was a culture that did not exist in our club and it was awesome to watch as a teacher because middle school is crazy you think middle school is crazy <laughs> so it can be really dramatic and this takes that out of it and I, it was just natural it just naturally happened for us but it was very powerful to watch and I don't so really start drama or anything either no we just well, kind of, I kind of want to unpack that a little bit. Like, okay. why, why do you think it was such a safe space? What made that possible? Um, Because probably because we had our teacher and she's <laughs> like, wasn't just like a teacher. She was kind of like all of us. She was part of all of us. Um, But also um, probably because like we were trying to share ideas and we didn't have time to scream at each other or yell at each other um but sometimes we may have got aggravated with one another but we didn't scream or anything we just dealt with it and it at the end it turned out great and i think it really helped for us and with drama and stuff i definitely don't think that would have helped or anything <laughs> so yeah well, I'm going to go cry for a minute because Karis is the sweetest girl ever. And then also I'd like to say, I mean, I really think the way we approached it and the way in which we were all at the same level made a huge difference going into that way, I think made everyone kind of feel safe about it. I don't yeah. know. I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you for the, um, for the authentic answers. You know, I've been working in the chat here on the side trying to answer some of the questions that are coming in. And one of the things that I'm noticing is the excitement level for this idea, right? Of getting girls involved, of being the voice to, you know, maybe take a club that's mostly, um, you know, boy centric and turning it into, hey, let's have something for the girls too. Or having a male leader step up to say, I wanna be a voice and I wanna help the girls step into this, this area. I've already been receiving emails. Um, keep them coming. Girls who game at Dell.com is, uh, is our email box. And I also put um, my email in there as well. Um, we, we didn't really talk about kind of the process of towards the end, right? So Ms. Unger talked about the curriculum and, and Matt talked about kind of the strategy and the contracting and the behind the scenes stuff that has to happen. And it's super simple. There, there's not a lot involved. Um, somebody in the chat asked about, you know, is this a sponsored thing in her country? They don't really, um, they frown upon sponsored events. The thing is, is Dell, Microsoft, and Intel, we sponsor it, but Kendall and I are educators, right? So our goal is to build teacher capacity and principal capacity. So Ms. Unger will be working with all the principals and other leaders to get them to understand why this is so important for kids, right? And let Karis take the microphone and say, this is why we need this at our middle school. And this is why this is important to us, the kids that go here, because it is crucial. It is critical. And we do now tie to high school and college and equity uh, division, also esports. I mean, the, the list kind of goes on and on and on. And I've been seeing a lot of things, um, 
you know, in, in the chat about uh, how is it different or how is it the same. And so one of the things I wanted to say is once they go through that curricular resource guide uh, for the 12 weeks, so it's basically a semester course is what it is. Some do it after school, some do it lunch, some do it, you know, club, some do it as, as a course. But at the end, they actually sit, submit something to us. It's a five minute or less video from their culminating challenge, right? And then judges from all around the world judge it against our rubric and we have a huge award ceremony. So maybe we could spend a minute just talking about how that culminating challenge works and uh, kind of what you do for the submission and how the awards worked. Okay, so the first time we did it, we did our restaurant. And what was really cool, some of my kids had come to, we had partnered um, and done some other things um, as far as learning about technology for um, a grant we had at our school. And this, so this was my tech squad kids. And it was really interesting to me to watch how they put everything they had learned from me the previous year before we were on Zoom into making this restaurant my kids created and i think i still think this is the coolest thing they created a learning space in the back of the restaurant for people to teach other people how to grow sustainable foods and make sustainable meals and i was just like oh my goodness these kids are amazing they had seen it in practice with adults in a technology setting and they turned it into what could you do in a community to teach everyone so they really spent a lot of time thinking about ideas. We talked a lot about sustainability and all of that went into our videos. Um, how did you feel about the video? You pay, you spent a lot of time with our big community for our second level. How did you feel about that process? I felt it was very stressful, <laughs> <laughs> but um, after I did it, cause it was my first time, it was really easy and I think I could do it again because we got on there, we went our separate ways. And what we tried to do was we did like our speech and I worked on that a little bit. Um, and I think from the restaurant to the whole neighborhood, um, the town, I think it, my confidence level jumped, like it got higher um, from speaking and I definitely liked how we went kind of our separate ways for a moment just to speak. Um, and I really liked how we like all helped each other with our scripts and stuff. Um, Cause that really helped me a lot. Um, and overall, I just really like how we did it all together, but we all did it ourselves too. Right, so what she's talking about is in our community, each one of the girls worked on a different piece of the community. What was your big piece that you worked on, Karis? My big piece, are we talking about the restaurant or the town? No, let's talk about the town. Let's just okay. throw it all out there, the big town. I made a little farmer's market. You did, it was one of my favorite things in the build, I and, loved it. And um, I was really stressed at first with how to put it together, but then I was like, what would I add if I had my own farmer's market? So I added like a little, picnic table at the end of it like a little sidewalk that connected to it so like they can sit down eat um and then there's a library right by it so after you got your book or something you can come to the farmer's market and like mothers and stuff if they drop their kid off to the library or something they can come there shop for foods. I mean, and that thinking is crazy, right? Okay, so now the girls have come up with a space for moms that they can safely drop their children off and come over and enjoy the farmer's market. I mean, you guys, this is crazy awesome, right? I was so excited when they were coming up with this stuff. It was nuts. I was like, these are middle school kids coming up with like life-changing things. Why are they not running the world? Seriously, very smart ideas, brilliant, creative, and they work together. It was like they just build it piece by piece on top and worked with each other. Even though hers was the farmer market, she worked with Emmy and the library and they came up with the whole scenario. So it was individual, but also collaborative as we were working. And I think that was pretty powerful. Yeah. Um, Which I think is, I think that's really important, right? Because I'm getting a lot of questions about, um, can we, can we do this internationally? Can we do this in another country? Is there anything, 
globally. And so I just want to say very quickly, since we've been talking about so many global competencies, right? We are planning to go global. So all the people that are hitting us up in the chat in the Q&A right now, we would love for you to reach out to us at girlswhogameatdell.com so that we can begin to have that conversation and potentially find those pilot areas and countries so that kids like Karis can talk to someone in Germany and they can chat about their communities of the future and they can chat about their eateries of the future or whatever the challenge is that, that semester. And you know, our students do get involved with creation of the challenges as well. And so the, having them talking and having them um, collaborating on the ideas will only make this better as we go international. So we do encourage those folks um, who are uh, beyond North America to reach out to us because I think that's gonna help kids like Karis and teachers like Debbie to just go global with these competencies. And I know that Kendall's also gonna talk about a piece around mentorship, which is one of our three pillars in Girls Who Game. So Kendall, take yeah. it away. Thanks, Carrie. So, you know, guys, we started off this session really talking about we started Girls Who Game as an opportunity to build the, the girl centric ecosystem in STEM because we know girls, um, especially minority females, are underrepresented in STEM fields, right? And so, one of our key pillars to really support in building that girl centric ecosystem is the mentorship component. And so, as part of the program, um, the clubs can participate in mentors from Dell, from Intel and Microsoft, and we have different um, opportunities for engagement from one-on-one -on -one mentors to one -on -one club mentors, but really just the opportunity for these girls to connect with somebody who's older in a, working in a STEM field and really listen and learn from them around their career pathway. So um, Matt, talk to, talk to us a little bit about kind of what we kind of did for the mentorship piece and kind of how we were kind of thinking about how would, how could we do this in JCPS and from a scaling perspective, knowing that, you know, we might have some, some mentors right in JCPS that they could use. So talk to us a little bit about the mentorship piece um, for you guys. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, uh, I, like I said, we are a, a school district of a hundred thousand people. We have three separate branches of our IT uh, kind of, department. Um, so we, we decided to kind of start internal. You know, we sent some emails out and said, hey, we have this awesome opportunity. We know that we have several awesome, amazing women in our IT department. Like, would you like to be mentors for our kids? Um, and I think probably the part that hurt us the most was we were still like in the throes of our coronavirus vacation that we were all on at home and not in the, in the building anymore. Um, uh, but we are also, you know, hoping to open that up to all the different industries that were around us too. You know, there's so many, um, there's a, there's several conferences in, in Louisville every year, um, women in tech. And there's a, I think it's called rocket, uh, women. Now it's, um, there's a couple different ones. And, uh, you know, these women in town are dying to have these opportunities to mentor these young girls around them. Um, so it, for us, it started out as, you know, let's find the people at Humana. Let's find the people in, um, like the Kentucky Lottery, who who thought so much tech goes into the lottery, right? There's people there too. Um, so let's find them and have them mentor our girls. That way they can see that these jobs, they don't just exist in New York City. They don't just exist in, in Washington or Seattle or Los Angeles. They exist here. They exist in Louisville, Kentucky. They exist in Kansas City, Missouri. They exist in ha Tallahassee, Florida. They're all over the place. So um, going into how we did the mentorship, you know, um, I think we may have mentioned before, Microsoft Teams is a big part of that. Um, Flipgrid is one of the things that uh, Girls Who Game has used uh, before um, for some mentorship and communication kind of tools. Um, we looked at doing a kind of like a round table, almost like we are now, where we had several of our, our clubs from different schools um, that would meet with a, a mentor at one time um, and, and kind of have that experience as well. Um, and then uh, we also looked at, a, I think, the more traditional model that Girls Who Game had done in the past was um, like a weekly check-in or um, like a one mentor to one club kind of thing. Um, so it, it can it can kind of go either way. And, you know, Kendall and everyone else at Girls Who Game is really just awesome at uh, being flexible and, and tailoring what the program is to what your, your needs are for your girls. I want to chime in on that. We were lucky enough that we got to do it both ways. And I got to see um, what way worked best for my girls. Uh, the first with the, the weekly check-ins um, during COVID, that was a little, it, that stressed me out a little bit, but in a normal school year, that would have been amazing. But 
It didn't work really well during COVID. So Girls Who Game was awesome. And I, I let them know, hey, this, this didn't really work for us. And they switched it. And then the second time, my girls had the opportunity to meet so many more leaders in technology instead of just one. It was fantastic. How did you feel the experience went when you got to talk to the other female leaders in technology? I felt that I learned a lot from them because I didn't get to do that before. And it was my first time um, getting to meet with them. And I learned a lot from how, from their perspective and um, just how to be a great girl in Girls Who <laughs> Game. Um, and they asked some questions and I got a really... Like before, I wouldn't really ask those questions to myself. So I got to speak to that and then got in my head, like Girls Who Game is great and um, it's a great learning experience for me. So from that, I really liked to see all that and see teachers and people from different counties just talking to me and asking me questions because it made me feel a lot better. So it was good. It was really good. And I, I want to throw that out again. Girls Who Game worked with us to meet the best needs of my student. And as a teacher, isn't that what we all want? I mean, that's what we want. And it was a really, really positive experience. And I got a shout out again, Julie Foss, our mentor this time. She is awesome. And she has been such a confident boost for my girls when they're working like, hey, they're so amazing. And my girls have gotten to participate in a lot of different things. Um, they got to do an esports conference. Thank you. Kendall for inviting us to that. So there was two middle school girls with all these other high school college kids. And I had all these messages from people like these girls are in middle school. Yeah, my girls are awesome. And they're in middle school. So it's been such a good opportunity to, for my girls to grow. And it, and it gave them other opportunities inside like girls who game but then it branched out into so many more things and ways they've done videos and matt helped us with this they spoke to the entire district they did a live for the whole district um they've talked to the entire every librarian in jcps has heard from my girls now and got to hear a little bit about how they learn and how everything works for us they've just had a lot of opportunities and as a teacher and an advocate for my kids, there is nothing else I ever could have done that would have been as beneficial as this has been for us. And also the relationships that I've been able to build with my students. It's just been fantastic. I'm going to stop talking. I'm just going on and on now. <laughs> So I think we probably have a chance for maybe one more question and then we'll open it up to Q&A if that sounds okay. Yeah, because we're getting so many great comments and sort of questions in the chat too. So I wonder if we should um, maybe lean into to one of those. That way we also are, are answering some of our questions and comments. We're hearing from people all over the world, um, Germany, New Zealand, um, the States. And so, you know, Kendall and I cover a certain region. We support education. So we support districts. Uh, in multiple states, but we also have colleagues who support districts in other states and we have colleagues in Canada. Um, and so as we said earlier, we are looking to go global. And so we would also like to hear from our friends all around the world. But, you know, if you're sitting in Cleveland or Washington DC or Kansas City or wherever you're sitting, you know, we can support you getting these clubs up and running and started. And we do a 12 week, you know, semester session. So our next one will be August, September timeframe. And so after that, it would be like a February to, to May or June kind of a time frame, just to give some examples around that. Um, you know, maybe we should think about some of the comments that we are seeing right now about, um, you know, making it competitive, but making it friendly and making that environment and that community really, really um, inviting for everyone. So whether they're coming in as a brand new Minecrafter, and I don't know, Karis, were you exposed to Minecraft at all prior to this? Um, not really. I did play a little bit with my cousins, but like not really. I didn't know a lot of, about it, um, but I definitely learned all about it and continue to learn about it next year. Um, but no, I didn't have barely any experience. Okay. None. So so yeah to go from an entry level right or someone who's been using it for a while i think that is another beautiful thing about girls who game is the entry point 
is anywhere. You can be zero or you can be at, you know, I'm an expert and you can still come in. We do have three levels. I don't know if we mentioned this earlier, but we have level one, two, and three. Um, and so we have a curricular resource guide that goes with each. Some of our teacher champions and principals like to you know, go level one more than once, so they get a really good, comfortable, confident feel for it. Some are ready. They're like, nope, I'm going one to two, then I'm going to three, I'm going to do esports, and then I'm gonna have my girls become mentors for others as Karis is going to be next year. And so, um, Kendall, Maybe we should, the chat is just on fire. So maybe we should, maybe we should start answering some of these or let people come on and ask yeah. us questions. Yeah, I think that sounds great, Carrie. Um, and somebody asked about the Critter Resource Guide. So if you'll email our um, Girls Who Game at Dell.com, Carrie, if you can put that back in the chat, that'd be great. Um, we can give you a high level kind of overview of that. Um, and hopefully that'll help. But yes, I mean, it's really important that there's an entry point for everybody, right? Like level one is that entry, like, hey, let's just figure out Minecraft. Let's, you know, learn from each other. Um, level two is really about building those girls' leadership skills. And so they're now becoming mentors for level ones. And then our level three is really focused on esports. And so we see that more kind of your high school or late middle school years working through that. That's helpful. I want to talk about um, winning the competition, like that that competition piece for a minute. When we first did it, we did the restaurant, and I didn't even know Matt like reached out was like congratulations, and we were in the top three, and I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, that was so. But then I got real excited, and the girls got real excited, so we went into level two to our for our final. Um, uh, community and it was like we want to do this we want to do this and then what place did we get Karis? second we got second place and we were so excited but then i think about all the things that my girls can do now because of girls who game and i'm like they absolutely should have gotten that this fantastic so the the competition i don't think it's more like we have to win we have to win did you feel yeah, like that yeah. at all no like we didn't approach it that way but it is super fun when you place it's awesome it was awesome and it was just it, I was just happy to do it, and I wasn't really worried about what place we got. Yeah, we just do it. It's just it's so fun to do that we weren't really thinking about that, but it is also fun to place. So, <laughs> well, and well, Diane uh, Diane Wilson asked, you know, as a teacher who doesn't game, what's the best way to support? And Debbie, you said it at the beginning. I wasn't gaming. I wasn't using Minecraft. She started at zero. So that's that's the beautiful nature of this is you can start with zero experience and work through it and allow the girls to work with you and teach you and show you. So I think that's amazing. And yes, some of the questions about can we combine with other leagues or other organizations to get more girls involved? Absolutely. Some of our clubs are involved with many other things, right? Uh, this is just one piece of their technology integration or their gamification. Um, and so I think the sky is the limit here. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Carrie. I mean, I think ultimately we go back to our goal, right? It's really to build that girl centric ecosystem in STEM fields. And so however we can make that happen, let's do it. So we're going to tag on to another program. We're going to reach out to many, many people. Like we just want to build that girl centric ecosystem for sure. Um, okay, attendees, if any of you want to come off or, uh, or come on camera and ask a question, we have a couple minutes left um, if you feel comfortable enough to do that. Um, while we're waiting for um, people to kind of uh, speak up here too, um, you know, going back to the, do I need to learn, know, know how to play Minecraft to be good at this? That was actually part of the training that we went through with our um, Girls Who Game coaches as well. Um, so I think I mentioned we had like the different sessions that people were a part of. Um, so, you know, Kendall brought in teachers and, and women leaders who are really, really exceptional at Minecraft to kind of fill in some of the gaps that people had as well. So. I think Jeremiah said it best. It's less about the experience and more about the passion we all have for our students. And so he, uh, Jeremiah happens to be one of our colleagues and he supports states in the Northeast. So if you're from the Northeast in, in the US, uh, he would be the person that would be cheering you on and championing your cause. We are so excited that you all joined us today. We know we're at the end of our time, um, but we're here. So if, if you have something to add or a question for us, uh, we'll be here for a minute or two and uh, we'd love to get to sync with you later.
Um, we had a we had a question in the chat. Does the teacher have to be a female or can male administrators? Um, so I was our district lead as a as a white male. Um, so I think I don't I think it may have been Eric that said you know he he's weird about being the loudest voice in the room as the the cis white male. Um, you know I was. That just means you got to get the other people in the room as fast as possible. So um, and I don't I mean I hope I made you know Debbie and Kendall and everyone feel comfortable while I was in there, but. Um, Definitely, don't be afraid to, and that's what the mentorship part is, right? You know, yeah. if you're a, if you're a male sponsor or coach for your girls who game club, you know they're still going to get the the exposure to uh, women leaders in tech because of the mentorship opportunities. So, yeah, and we uh, we use Cash. Do you want to come over a minute? We use my tech squad gentleman. This is Cash. He's Karis's older sister. He helped us a lot as we were learning um, about Minecraft, and he helped teach Karis. And when we had Minecraft questions. We went to Cash, and he has learned a lot, and also become a huge leader for us in our Girls Who Game group. And, and that's, you know, probably a different look. But he was in thrown into a girl, uh, all girl group of gamers, and he helped us, and he continues to. So there's nothing wrong with guys helping out with our Girls Who Game. That's right. Thanks, Cash, and thanks, Matt, and thanks to all of the men on the call today who want to support this. We need that. Well, thanks so much, guys. We really appreciate it. Email us with questions. Um, we are happy to continue the conversation, answer questions. Just let us know. But again, thank you, Roundtable. We couldn't do this without you guys. And Karis, you did a phenomenal job. Thank you. You thank stole you. the show. Thank Bye, you. Guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for Thank you. Me. Be a coach, be a mentor. Ooh, we're saying game on. One, two, three. Game, game on. on. <laughs> Bye, guys.